Okay, welcome. Uh, today we have Bruce Tao uh, visiting us remotely from Boston. Unfortunately, I failed to record the first slide or two of Bruce's presentation. So what I want to do is share those first couple of slides with you. Um, Bruce is a widely experienced and highly flexible complex problem solver. Uh, he spent 40 years in IT, including co-founding Oracle's applications division, uh, before moving to general purpose problem solving as a consultant. Um, he was the CEO and co-founder of the not-for-profit Synthesis Institute from 1993 to 2019. Um, he serves on two boards, uh, the not-for-profit Quater and the for-profit Sales X, and he re recently published his book, Wise, Gaining, Using, and Retaining Wisdom for Lifelong Success, uh, which I recommend. And he can be reached at uh, btow, that's B-T-O-W, at ix.netcom.com. So I'm going to start his slides. Uh, so the title of Bruce's talk is Multidisciplinary Problem Solving. A few insights and the goals for his session are to synthesize, sensitize uh, the audience to the unique nature of these problem types and to share some insights from a lifetime of studying them. And with that, I will hand it off to Bruce. Why are they so darn hard to resolve? Uh, and SRI International used to be called back when I talked to them, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Stanford, Stanford Research. Uh, they had some interesting insights into multidisciplinary problems mentioned in the article that, uh, that Russ passed out. And uh, they had a concept they called a bridge person and I'm gonna try to explain why that works so well. And then people come in various shapes, okay? And uh, there's a spectrum, a couple of spectra that I've described in some of my writing about uh, understanding where people fit in shapes. And because when you know that, you can also then judge how they might be used in multidisciplinary problem solving. And I make the point too that it's very important to understand particularly multidisciplinary problems before you try to solve them and then give you a short reading list that you can carry away with you. So let's talk a little bit about multidisciplinary problems. So Dr. Jerry Talley is an organizational development fellow, uh, lives in San Jose area. Uh, he came up with an interesting list of six, the first six of these uh, problem types. And uh, so you can read these, but you know, a puzzle, you know, has straight for an engineering type approach. An example of that be some water engineer is expected to estimate the volume of a pr proposed reservoir. And you can use tables and structure and you know, relatively straightforward means. It can be hard work, but it, it's re relatively straightforward means to solve the problem. Another type of a problem is a challenge with overwhelming options, but only subjective criteria for solutions. A trivial choice, except for the pandemic happening, would be what are you planning to do this summer for vacation? You can go, the, the, the only subjective criteria that helps you decide what's your best option. Uh, an uncertainty uh, you know, is a problem whose resolution depends on certain on future unknowable events. An example of that would be how soon will the US economy recover from the pandemic? Okay, we're not gonna know that without data that will come out of future activities and future events. A dispute is where two people, two or more people have, uh, or parties have conflicting interests. Uh, and a former employee, sorry, a former employee feels that he was unfairly terminated, would be an example of one of those. Uh, a dilemma, a problem where affected parties have simultaneous commitment to competing but essential goals. An example of that might be allocating a limited expense budget between departments. Everybody wants a larger amount to be able to achieve their the, the most most that they can achieve, but they don't have the uh, you know, they don't have an unlimited amount. They have to divide it in such a way that somebody everybody has to be cut a little bit short. And those are interesting type of a problem. Complexity, which we'll talk about far more about the detail of, uh, is a problem where many parties are reacting to one another or where there are many involved disciplines. Uh, an example of that might be trying to come up with improvements to the US healthcare system with lots and lots of interconnected parts and lots and lots of parties conflicting. Uh, and 
you know, when we talk about multidisciplinary problems, they mostly fall into the category of complexities and vice versa. So those, that's the category that fits that the most. A contrivance is one that I actually argued for that Dr. Jerry Talley didn't agree with, but uh, we, we, we agreed to disagree. And that is a problem where one or more parties have invented the problem or set itself or overstated its impact. Uh, several years ago, there was a challenge where they were, somebody was trying to introduce the ability for doctors to get paid to have end of life conversations with patients. And somebody invented the concept that that would be causing death panels. So if you had such a thing, you would have people deciding who lived and who died. And that was made up by the person, by somebody as a means of making that not happen, not because they believed it would happen, but because they believed it would influence others. So, the unique nature of a multidisciplinary problem uh, is that you have multiple and interconnected disciplines. So no, you, if it can easily be broken down into its pieces, each one of which fits a particular discipline, it's not a multidisciplinary problem. It just is a combination of a bunch of non single disciplinary problems. Oh, and I did want to make the point, by the way, if you have questions, uh, feel free to toss them in over chat and uh, to the group and then you know might as well do it to everybody so that people can see what people have already asked so they don't ask again and that when we have time for question and answer that's where we'll start so when you do, when you need to staff a multidisciplinary problem solution effort of some kind you have to either have a team of specialists that fit the various disciplines involved that sort of work sort of surround the problems domain and i'll be talking more about how to compose such teams and then, or a single person, but a fairly unusual one. And that we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, when I talk about a multidisciplinary problem, you might have a multidisciplinary problem, say, in the world of urban planning. And if you don't have an urban planner, it's to you, it's a multidisciplinary problem. Because you have to basically form the content that would cause an urban planner to ultimately, you know, the, sort of the stuff that surrounds what urban planning involves. with. If you have an urban planner, it ceases to be a multidisciplinary problem. And sometimes you have to work hard to figure out even what specialties are involved. And there's a technique that I have that does help me do that. So this is SRI International had an interesting thing that they found, which was that, that their project succeeded or failed. If and this is over a three year period with no, absolutely no counterexamples for every project they did that was multidisciplinary, it succeeded or failed depending upon whether it had a particular type of a person on the project or not. And then we'll talk a little bit more about this type of a person, but it's roughly the type of a person who thinks everybody else's work is a little bit more interesting than their own work. They love to jump outside of their standard boundaries and uh, tackle other people's problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it drives, typically drives the, uh, the specialists completely nuts, but it actually turned out to work. If you have such a person on the project, it succeeded. And I described a before and after here. So uh, you'll notice you have solid borders around the specialties one and two, and a third one that is starts with a solid border on specialty three. Those are the three, say you have a problem that requires contributions from those three specialties. Uh, the solid border in the case of specialty one and specialty two represents that you have somebody who has in their, in their head, it's an invisible boundary that says, I'm either interested in something or I'm not interested in it. And it's fairly well defined, although never written down. And I, I'll give you an example of what I mean by such a thing. So imagine if you could a brain surgeon, just in your mind, envision a brain surgeon experienced, good at what they're doing, confident in the operating room, et cetera. And you come to them and you say, Dr. Smith, I'm going to give you an offer for the same effort and the same, the same cost and the same effort. I'm going to let you either learn a new technique for operating on the pituitary gland, or I'm going to teach you Arabic. Now your brain surgeon, it seems highly likely he's going to say, A, of course, I'm going to pick the one for pituitary gland. And if he's rude, he'll say, that was the stupidest question anybody's ever asked me. That's because what you asked him for the second option about learning Arabic was so clearly outside of what he's defined as his boundary of what he's interested in. 
And therefore, he's obviously going to have, you know, instantaneously want to glom onto something that is inside his boundary. And uh, so specialty one and specialty two are those types of people uh, that have these boundaries. A bridge person, it turns out, has a boundary around their specialty. I mean, you know, that the, they may have a specialty of their own. They may be quite a good at their specialty, but they actually are born or, you know, developed without such a boundary. So they have... Uh, in their minds, if you ask them a question like the one I asked the brain surgeon, they'd have to think about it. Which one seems to make more sense right now? Which one seems more interesting? A lot of the time, they're more interested in something that's new to them than something that they already know because they love extending the breadth of their knowledge. And it turns out if you put such a person on the project, and this is sort of this, this project right here, what happens is, is their influence, because they're going to start asking questions of specialty one and specialty two, they're going to start asking basic questions. You know, what do you call this? Why do you do this? Gee, you know, what, talking to specialty two, he says, you know, specialty one calls it this. That's interesting. You guys share the same concept, but use a different word for it. And through their interaction, they cause specialty two and speci specialty one and specialty two to have their boundaries blur typically around the problem space, because that's where the focus of most of the questions will be, until everybody in the team has a boundary now, a new boundary that surrounds the entire problem that you're trying to solve. They're then incented to ask questions of specialists outside of their specialty area, as long as they fit within the problem space that is their new broadened boundary. So they're interested where they overlap, but they don't overlap enough up here to work, but down here they do. And that when you combine that, SRI discovered that that is like adding yeast to bread dough. It causes the bread to rise every single time. And it's a, it was wonderfully, wonderfully uh, uh, valuable. Now, specialists, uh, see, I'm, so specialists speak a very useful jargon. We'll go back to this particular one. So specialists speak a very useful jargon but they tend to devalue people who don't understand that jargon, okay? Particularly if you're talking about work that is impacting their own work. So imagine your brain surgeon who is working on a problem that he considers to be within his boundary of brain surgery and he's talking to an accountant. And the accountant says, well, what about this idea? Okay, well, if the accountant isn't speaking the, the jargon of the brain surgeon, he may be talking about the same thing, but the brain surgeon will not feel like it's a comfortable conversation. He will not typically value the contribution coming from it. And an example you might make is if you are uh, working in say you're an artificial intelligence uh, specialist and you're speaking to somebody who is, it turns out, is one of the most brilliant artificial intelligence people in the world, who is a fellow from Bolivia whose English is very halting and his use of the jargon you're used to using in English on this topic is, is poor. It's gonna be very hard for you as an AI specialist to feel like you feel strongly that that person has something to tell you. And so you'll tend to, you'll tend to weaken their ability to communicate that. As long as you're speaking the same jargon, you, know, you, you share, and this, this is one of the things that happens right here is you begin to speak the same jargon around the problem space, then you can start to say, oh, that's an idea. I might, you know, let's, let's add that idea to our list of things we do. And just is a very interesting approach. And I found that to be, you know, super, super useful. So the, this bridge person we talked about, SRI International, uh, one of the former SRI staff members wrote a book called Managing for Responsive Research and Development. And he listed these characters, characterizations, I think there's 14 or 15 of them. And uh, I originally actually first ran into this list and came to, the, you know, saw the book, read the book, saw the list and said, they're describing me. And so I chased down the author and he pointed me to the fellow who's still at SRI, who is the head of innovation, a fellow named Dr. Joseph McPherson. And then I had the, the great good fortune to uh, then uh, meet with Dr. McPherson a couple of times and pick his brains, which was a, an absolute delight. And so he and I had a couple of wonderful conversations. He was delighted to find somebody else interested in that sort of a thing. And I'll talk a little bit more about what he and I talked about. Let's talk about types of people or shapes of people. So arguably, people fall into one of three types. These are typical, we're talking about adults. So I-shaped are maybe 90% of adults are what I call I-shaped. And what, this, what, the, what the shape is, is the 
width, breadth and depth of knowledge that the person has. So a, a, a short fat eye is like a sort of a generalist within the field, a person who's a physicist, but he's not a specialist physicist. A person who is a uh, general practitioner physician might be sort of a short squat eye shape uh, because he has a fair breadth within his knowledge of within the world, but only within the world of medicine, but he's, it's not terribly deep in any one area because of that breadth. Uh, a person who is a uh, knee surgeon who operates only on knees caused by football sporting injuries, which there are people just like that, he's going to have a very tall, very narrow shaped eye, but he's still going to be eye shaped. And about 90% of adults seem to be eye shaped predominantly. And having a border around your interests is what causes an eye shape to be formed. In other words, you, you realize you start to gain knowledge again and again and again, but it's always within that boundary. And the eye shape is in effect the boundary. And as a person becomes subspecialized, they narrow it and make it higher. So they become, you're, you're, you're a physicist, now you're going to become a plasma physicist. You start ignoring astrophysics input. You stop trying to read astrophysics articles, etc. The second kind we're talking about here is T-shape. This is somebody with in, you know, quite good depth in one, at least one area, possibly more than one, but typically one. Uh, and that depth is, however, complemented by the fact that they have very, very shallow, but broad knowledge about a ton of other things. And uh, a bridge person is T-shaped. So the bridge person, the type of person becomes the bridge person is T-shaped. So this is the person who, in order to make a living, has to focus his work on a particular field. But their interests outside of their field cause this not terribly deep, but very broad top bar of the T of knowledge. And you'll hear other people talk about T-shaped people. And what they're talking about is pretty much the same personality that becomes a bridge person. And that's maybe five to 10% at most of the uh, population are type T. They're relatively rare. SRI found that it was typically about one in, one in, one in 20 of their staff members were T-shaped, maybe even slightly less. There's a third type, quite rare, so it's probably less than 1%, that I call dash-shaped. And I'm one of the few people who uses this term. So this is a person who has, might have been T-shaped when they were younger and had to focus on a particular field to make a living, or maybe was always this way, but typically somebody who's got insane breadth and not much depth in, in much of anything. So they have incredibly wide knowledge of the way things are. They can correlate information in widely disparate fields. You can bring them in to solve a problem that is involving a combination of something to do with medical ontologies, artificial intelligence, and economics. They're perfectly comfortable jumping into that because you know they, they're also about borderless and they don't have any they don't have anything holding them back. Now, when SRI assigned bridge people to projects, they would assign them as a specialist in the the vertical bar of the T but take advantage of their breadth to cause them to influence the project to succeed. So that was interesting. And he, Dr. McPherson and I, and one of the second time I met with him, I actually stipulated, can a person be, and we use different terminology, but can a person be dash shaped? He talked a lot about you know, eye shaped and T shaped. I didn't use those terms either, but that's what he meant. And he said, no, they can't really. You have to have something that is a specialty that gives you depth in order to actually make it, make it work at all. And I said, Dr. McPherson, we're both from a scientific field. He was an industrial engineer by training. And I said, you know, you and I have, uh, you know, I'm listening to what you're having to say. And you and I are both mathematicians, you know, both scientists, scientists. And I've always known that if you have one exception to a rule that the, that of the theorem, then the theorem is false. And he said, that's true. And I said, Dr. McPherson, you don't have a vertical bar. And he said, you're right. I guess I don't. And, you know, I guess, you know, but I'm, it's going to be pretty rare. And I said, I can accept rare, but I can't accept none. So rare, less than 1%. And it was an interesting discussion. So I talked a, a little bit about two types of spectra. And this is a sort of a graph here that shows two spectra called M and N. 
one spectrum is the M to N spectrum and the other is O to U spectrum. Now M and N has to do with the type of new knowledge that a person's interested in gaining. So if a person's interested in gaining knowledge, and typically this is gonna be somebody with a border, very, very bordered, if their interest is primarily in increasing mastery of the area of their interest, then they're gonna be on the M end of the scale. And if their interest in learning new things is skewed toward learning new things, they're gonna be on the N end of the scale. And there's a second spectrum that, that is interesting because uh, I call it the O to U, and that is it's your motivation for that new learning might be that because you want to organize it, make profit, make use of it, or you might just simply get joy in understanding the new thing. And so I thought you'd find that interesting. So if you had an I-shaped person, where might they fit in this graph? Let's take a look. There they are. So they have highly skewed toward you know, increasing their mastery of what they already know and in understanding it as well as possible. You know, that, that they're skewed toward that. Making use of it might be interesting, but it's, it's not quite as interesting as just understanding it. And so that's where that person might fit. So let's talk about another type of a person. So where might a bridge person, remember our friend the bridge person, the T-shaped person, where might they fit? Well, there they are. Okay, they're not quite all the way to the end because they still have a specialty area and they still may be motivated to learn a mastery, more mastery, but they're skewed toward the new, new learning area. And they're also deeply on the understanding area. Okay, uh, I considered myself a bridge person at the time I talked to Dr. McPherson, uh, although I've, I've evolved a bit since then, but I was a bridge person back then. This would have described me perfectly. I had to be more interested in you know, mastery of what I of what I already knew in order to make a living uh, working in software. But I was much more interested actually in new, and it was I was interested in understanding far more than I was interested in making use of that understanding. So now, if you had a person who is a manager of specialists, so somebody who really is a specialist type, you know, you know, you know say a head of engineering for a software company. That person is going to typically be farther up the curve because they're now more interested in making use of that new knowledge, that new knowledge within, a, again, within their, their mastery area. So they will tend to be there. And now if you had somebody who is a general manager, they might, be, they might fit more in the middle somewhere. Okay, your general manager can't be too specialized because you know they have to be able to make have conversations, intelligent conversations with uh, you know their accounting people and with their human resources people and with their technology people. They have to fit somewhere, and that that's where they might do it. Now we talked about a dash shaped person. Where might they fit? There they are. Okay, and I call I I tend to call a dash shaped person a synthesis. It's my own terminology for this. This is a person who has abandoned any specialty. They are as, almost as far as you could possibly go in terms of learning new things. They're far more interested in learning new things and understanding them and integrate. Typically the understanding process is an, is an activity that is just integration of what they know with what they already know. So they might well get extreme joy about learning something completely new and then saying, you know, this is really, analogous to this concept in something I already heard about. And this is something I've used in my professional career many, many times, that type of integration. And so, uh, and by the way, that I've evolved, I believe now to be really more of a synthesis than a bridge person in my world. My interest in taking advantage of what I learn is I might tactically do it, but strategically, and my heart is in understanding it and integrating it with other things. Now, if, would you, can you imagine anything that might be up here in the upper right corner? Okay, and it turned out I read a very interesting book, science fiction book, back, it was written a long, long time ago, like in the 70s, by an author named Alexei Panshin. And he wrote a book called Rite of Passage that talked about synthesis, and it also talked about them working with somebody who would fit in this upper corner. And his book called them Ordinologists. And I sort of stipulated that such a thing must exist, such a type of a person must exist, but uh, I couldn't imagine who it might be until about 10 years ago when I actually ran across one of them. He's a fellow named Tom and he lives in, lives in the Bay Area. 
and uh, he is in fact an ornologist. And he's had a he's had a uh, a resume that was the more, one of the more bizarre resumes you've ever heard of in your entire life. You know, he's not done everything from writing books on physics to being the head of IT. He was, he was the co-head of IT for the U.S. executive branch at one point. But he also recently wrote a book on physics. So he's just, you know, no, no particular specialty. He's all over the place. He loves learning new things. But when he learns them, he tries to organize them a little bit like the Dewey Decimal System. So if you put, had to have somebody that you put in charge of an ontology, it would probably be an, on, an ornologist and make a pretty darn good one for that purpose. So, and uh, by the way, I, I developed a PowerPoint that if you answer about 15 questions, it will tell you where you fit on these. It'll basically draw a circle saying you fit about here on this spectrum, on these double spectra. So if any of you are interested, my email address is in the, in the presentation. Sorry about the noise. My email address is in the presentation, and uh, you know, you can send me, send it to me, and I will send you a copy of the uh, PowerPoint. I knew they'd. I get I get I get uh, spam calls all day long on my home phone. I apologize for that making that noise. It would shut up in a second. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, understand first, resolve second. So I always, whenever I'm taking on a problem, particularly a multidisciplinary problem. I never try to solve it without first trying to understand it. And it, you know, so it's kind of like ready, aim, fire, or ready, fire, aim. Ready, fire, aim, you're gonna miss the bad guy, shoot the innocent, or oftentimes you'll do both. Or you'll waste time and use up all the budget you had available to solve the problem, and now the problem's not solved and you're out of money. So it's a, uh, it's a bad strategy. So if you don't understand first, then, then you are doing ready, fire, aim. and uh, a, a lot of the problems that happen in attempts to solve problems is somebody who says, ah, I know what the problem is, I'm gonna dive in and start to solve it, but they in fact understand one aspect of the problem, which is typically the aspect of the problem that fits their specialty. You know, it's like a ham to hammer every problem as a nail. They jump in, solve that problem, and perhaps cause worse than nothing. They, they grab the first promising solution, but in fact use budget and cause worse problems elsewhere. Not much fun to do that. So I tend to use a concept for the hardest problems, and it's only only really need to do it for the hardest problems. Uh, I use a concept called a structured problem definition. Uh, and I have a template that I can send you and send you examples and such. So I've written, for instance, uh, either in my own professional work or as uh, avocational interest or as exercise, I've, for instance, written them in for things like uh, the US healthcare system and conflict in the Middle East. And uh, there was one that I did for an international not-for-profit, uh, which had to do with their having trouble with achieving their mission doing former child soldier reinstatement into society after a civil war. And uh, uh, I used that as a means of getting my head wrapped around their problem. And then once that happened, it worked out pretty well that I was able to help them suggest what to do next. And these, you know, I'm not going to go through the details of this. If you're interested in the copy of the PowerPoint, you can get that from uh, from Doc, Dr. McBride. Uh, but these are the list of things that you actually look at. Not all, might only be some of them, but the, you use the those, work on the applicable ones on this list. So you want, you know, an example is is you write an abstract and what are the symptoms of the problem and what is it, how does it break into pieces. You know, how do you, what are potential solutions? Uh, what, are, what solutions have been suggested by other parties? You know, and so you kind of try to gather everything you can know about what the problem is before you actually attempt to solve it. And I find that to be uh, a really, really useful way to go after the hardest of the hard problems. And here is a list of books that I would find interesting if I were trying to read about books or, or in some case, PowerPoint. Uh, that are things I found interesting. Uh, this book by Stafford Beer, he's a former, he's a, he's a, a, a since deceased, but he's a used to be a professor of University of Manchester in England, wrote a fascinating book that he considered to be the definitive work on the topic of, of uh, uh, what, I guess, what would you call that? I'm, I'm blanking. So cy management cybernetics. And he spends time talking about things like 
uh, what is a viable system and what you have to have to make a viable system work. And he works kind of from first principles. It's a very hard book to read, but well worth it. That book I mentioned that talked about this, pages 161 to 163 talk about the, uh, uh, the definition of a bridge person. This book has been probably isn't really in print anymore, but you can get a copy if you need to. Uh, I found particularly the uh, systems thinking section of the fifth discipline to be a wonderful thing. Jerry, Dr. Jerry Talley, he has the problem solving PowerPoint that lists the first six of those and talks about them. That book I mentioned, Rite of Passage, that's the, uh, that was the, uh, uh, th that book that I found, the science fiction book that had those terms. Uh, that's the book I wrote uh, last year on, uh, on learning wisdom. And then the article that, that uh, Dr. McBride passed out is this article on synthesis that he talked about. And how much time did I leave? I actually left a reasonable amount of time. I think I left about 10 minutes, maybe 13 minutes. So any discussion, et cetera, as time allows, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And then I will look to see what we have for uh, chat and questions. Yeah, I posted one question up, but uh, I think standards dictate that I open it up to questions from any of the grad students first before you address my question that I posted in the chat window. So if any of you guys, um, Desiree, Charles, uh, Taylor, have questions, um, Theo, um, Armand is one of my former entrepreneurship students. Nice. Uh, Jonathan, if any of you guys have questions, please, um, you know, unmute and- uh, Yeah, there's not that many of you, just unmute. I well, don't maybe, have a question, but I'd like to say thank you for coming to present. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And, and uh, is your last name Dweeks? It's, it's Weeks. That's D Weeks. Oh, D, okay. D Weeks. I was thinking, I, I've heard Weeks before. I never ran across a Dweeks. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad it's not Dweeks. Weeks is bad enough. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it <laughs> should work, though. Thank you very much. And uh, are, are you a graduate student there? Yes, I am in management of complex systems. Oh, how fun. How yeah, fun. so your presentation is applicable. Oh, marvelous. Yeah, I occasionally have the joy of attending a lecture either remotely or in person, not recently, of course, uh, at, the, at the MIT Systems Design and Management uh, School, which is a lot of fun because a lot of those people are, are basically bridge people. Thank you. Thank you. On mute. Yeah, I would like to thank you as well. And especially for for two days consecutive effort. Thank you so much, Bruce. I appreciate that. Yeah, I also want to thank you for being the only speaker uh, once COVID hit to maintain <laughs> their promise to give a talk. Um, everybody else found a remote talk uh, too unpleasant or they were too uh, attached to the idea of getting to visit Yosemite when they came out here to visit. Well, I'll, I'll make it another time. <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome back anytime. Thank you. And and I will tell you a joke that you might enjoy that has Yosemite in it. <laughs> okay. Since you brought up the topic. So uh, it turns out that you know, at one point, Sherlock Holmes and Watson visited the U.S. and the West Coast and uh, actually went and took a carriage down to, uh, to the, actually it was the Tuolumne Meadows area because they wanted to go camping in Tuolumne Meadows. So they hiked off into the, you know, off to the one end of Tuolumne Meadows, found a good spot, pinched their tent, got inside, went to sleep. About two in the morning, Holmes wakes up Watson and he says, Dr. Watson, I wish you would tell me what you observe and tell me what you deduce from what you observe. And Watson thinks for him and he says, well, Holmes, I see a million, million stars. And some of the stars must have planets and some of those planets must have life. There were so very many stars, perhaps some of that life is intelligent life. So I, I deduce that there might be intelligent life also in the universe. How about you, Holmes? Holmes says, Watson, you fool, they've stolen our tent. <laughs> nice. Not too bad. Anyway, so your, your question, Russ, was, uh, you know, was there any follow-up with the result? Is there, are you talking about follow-up at, at, at SRI or follow-up on my own? Uh, either at SRI or externally, specifically regarding uh, coming up with a means to identify these bridge people. And it sounds like you have a little uh, questionnaire you put together that can yeah, I put together a questionnaire that sort of rates you. 
uh, on those two spectra, which would then give you a sense as to whether you're a bridge person. Uh, but it also, you know, at SRI, they didn't try to actually formalize much of anything. From their vantage point, a, and I can do the same. If you know the person, you very rapidly realize that they're a bridge person. Okay, they, they're, they're very quirky personalities. They have, you know, they, they uh, you know, can't resist asking questions. They can't resist picking other people's brains about topics that are way outside of their area of interest. And, you know, you'll spot them every time. But if you're trying to, you know, sort of find them outside of your set of acquaintances, uh, that's hard to do. And they never tried. And uh, they never actually did much formally other than recognize that it was pretty useful to have these people around. And, uh, and one thing they did do is, is they told the project managers, I don't care if these people are annoying, put them on your project anyway. Because they were in fact blackballing them, at one point blackballing them because they're so darned annoying. But yeah. if you blackball the one person who's gonna make your project succeed, that was a, uh, that's not a very bright thing to do. I actually had a bit of an argument with, uh, with Dr. Wayne Pearson because I asked him what else he did other than just allow them to be on teams. And he said, no, that's about it. And I said, so imagine the economic value of, of the person. That, you know, say that person is, uh, uh, what's the right way of putting it? So say the person is uh, just sick. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bridge person, but a bridge person who 95% of their time is probably spent sticking to their knitting because their manager gives them work to do and they have to get their work done. So 95% of their time, their dollar value of their hours is roughly the same as everybody else's. Let's call it $40 an hour. I'm just making up a number. But that 5% of their time, when they're asking the questions that cause other people's boundaries to expand, their time is worth 10 times that. Yeah. You know, you, you, that that's, that's gold. The rest of it's all nice, but it's, you know, the rest of it's, you know, is, is bronze or brass, but this is gold. And, he, and I said, if you have, a person spending 5% of their time doing something really valuable and 95% of the time doing something less valuable. My question is, my thought, first thought would be, why can't we get them to do more of it? Why can't they, for instance, do this for multiple projects? And he actually admitted he himself was something who, who would occasionally get brought into other projects to help them out. And what he was really doing is kind of doing what the bridge people were doing. But because he didn't have a base specialty, they wouldn't assign him to a project normally, uh, you know, as, as a specialist. They just sort of assign him on an occasional basis, which is actually a fairly efficient way of using him. Since he was head of innovation, he was doing a lot of sales and activities and a lot of development. Interesting concept. And yeah. uh, he said, that's true, but I guess I, don't, I just don't think they're ready for that. And we, that was our last conversation, so I never was able to follow up. Yeah, that's too bad. I mean, it's amazing how rarely firms will actually do an analysis and see uh, and try to investigate what made projects succeed versus projects fail. Mm -hmm. So it's um, the results, you know, that's written up in the Futurist that you described here at SRI is fascinating. You know, another, the one that's probably most famous at this point is uh, Project Aristotle at Google. So um, I'm wondering if you are familiar with that or what do you, what you think about their conclusions? And if I recall- Okay, so there, um, someone can correct me if they're more familiar with it. It's been a while since I've looked at it. But the basic conclusion they came to was that it's critically important that you uh, allow airtime for everybody on the team. To, and so it was basically kind of a communication. There's, there's a couple other components I'm forgetting, but I believe that was the most prominent one. Uh, You've got to give airtime to the people everybody on the team um, from whatever perspective they're operating from. So right. it's, um, you know, it's kind of the, the SRI result is a lot more specific and to me, um, you know, a bit more interesting. And I'm wondering if some of the results that Google got with Project Aristotle, where they had their own conclusion about what makes the project successful and other projects fail. Um, right. I wonder if that isn't, you know, potentially derivative from, uh, you know, maybe what's actually going on, which is something like the, you know, the gadfly effect or the bridge person mm -hmm. effect that right. it could uh, be. McPherson found. Now, I'll, I'll mention another thing I mentioned to McPherson which in that same conversation. I said, bear in mind that this person who is doing this 
non-specialist activity 5% of his time on a project? He's doing so against both massive management and massive peer pressure. If he pushed to do something else by both his management and his peers, his peers find it annoying. They want to avoid him. They try, you know, they discourage him. They look uninterested when he talks to them, you know, and his manager is leaning on him. How come you're not getting your work done? And so I said, for every one person who spends 5% of their time, and I'm, I'm rephrasing it a little bit here, for every one person who spends 5% of his time, you might have two more who are T-shaped people who have been whipped into submission. They may be, they may be a T-shaped person, but they're not, at, they're not being T-shaped on the project. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're not asking the basic questions of the other people and causing them to expand their boundaries. Because you whipped them into you whipped them into submission, at least on those projects. Now you send them home. They spend all their time on reading. You know, reading this was a long time ago. You know, reading Encyclopedia Britannica and working their way through the reference section of their of their local library, or whatever it is they do. You know, but for everyone that does misbehave, there's probably two or three others that that don't, but would if you gave them permission. Yeah. And so they're T-shaped people, but they're not allowed to be. T you know, they've been taught not to be a T-shaped at work. Which yep. then causes that effect to not work. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that makes perfect sense, actually. Um, I should so uh, for everyone who doesn't know, Bruce lived through the massive growth of Oracle. Um, how many employees were there when you got there? So I got I was an employee number two fifty one. Two fifty one, and, and I left seven years. And I left seven years later. It was over ten thousand. Yeah. So you were there during the the critical growth phase. Um, that was so, going pretty fast. <laughs> and you played a, an absolutely pivotal role in, in that growth process um, and helping Oracle shift over to apps and outside of just being a narrow uh, relation database management company. Do you, we got a couple of minutes left, so I just wanted to give you the opportunity, if you feel like it, to share you know, a war story from that period at Oracle or maybe you know, a war story from your current consulting practice oh sure let me see if i can think of an interesting one so uh let's see I'm trying to think of a good one or maybe well, I'll, tell you, i'll tell you one that's a little bit humorous of sorts okay so larry ellison as as most people know is a bit of a you know he, he does high profile fairly exciting things okay that's he's kind of about i'm not sure if he's adrenaline junkie but he's got something like that in him so uh he decided one, this was during the three years I was working directly for him. Uh, he decided at one point that, you know, that I don't care if this beach in Waimea Canyon, you know, I'm sorry, Waimea, uh, Oahu, I don't care if it's closed. I'm going swimming anyway. So he we went body surfing in Waimea when there were 20 foot waves. And uh, this didn't actually work out as well as he'd hoped. And he, got, <laughs> he, he uh, fractured his, his neck his several ribs and his uh, skull uh, and was bar barely made it through that alive and was rather beat up and uh, that, that tempered him a little bit. He calmed down a little bit for a little while uh, while that was healing. But once it healed, he sort of went back to his old ways and he realized that riding a mountain bike really fast and crossing a railroad track at a 45 degree angle is also a really bad idea. And, uh, what happened, of course, is the bike went one way and he kept going. And uh, so he ended up breaking his, uh, his upper arm in eight places and uh, being housebound for several weeks while that healed. And uh, uh, so anyways, I was one of the, you know, he, he, he really loved to do things that were very exciting and he didn't, other people didn't need to know about them. A lot of people might think he was kind of a publicity hound, but I don't think he actually is. He just loves doing stuff that is wild and wacky. And uh, every time it turns south on him, he does. He sort of tempered for a little while, but then goes back to it again. Uh, so that was an, that was a little bit interesting. Uh, that was close to an actual war story. And then I'll um, maybe uh, maybe the last question, unless somebody else has a question, is what kind of advice you would give to um, the students we have online right now? So we've got a bunch of PhD students in uh, the management of complex systems department here who are gonna be you know, either going out in the academic world 
um, in a few years or heading out into the civilian sector and you know looking for jobs maybe in management somewhere in one of the firms in Silicon Valley or something. Is there any, um, or maybe a section of the book you'd recommend or um, just some general advice you'd have for them heading out into the workforce? Yeah, maybe, maybe general advice is the best thing. So uh, think in terms of, you know, qualify yourself as best you can, uh, what type of a person you are, what shape you are. And, you know, if you are of that shape, you're not likely to change just because you say, oh, I ought to change. You're just going to change. I mean, you're, you're going to, that's how you are. It's more or less how you're hardwired. But that doesn't mean you can't learn how to work with and value those that are shaped differently. So if, let's say, and if you're in this, the systems department that you're talking about, I think you're more likely to be T-shaped than most people. Learn, understand it. Figure out the best way to take advantage of that shape and to, you know, to have your work work well with that. Become good at talking to other, not other people who are I-shaped and in ways that are maybe less annoying. I mean, you could be annoying or not annoying. Uh, I'm, I'm typically not very annoying when I talk to people, even when I was T-shaped, I wouldn't be that annoying as a, a slightly different manner. But, uh, uh, but some people are, and you know, it, it's a lot easier to catch flies with honey. And so learn how to do that well and learn to value it in yourself and learn to basically practice that activity of learning something new and integrating it with what you already know and doing it over and over and over again, uh, and just building it, you know, building up as a muscle. Now, if you're not T-shaped, let's say you're likely to be I-shaped. Well, if you're I-shaped, realize that T-shaped people, for certain circumstances, are insanely useful. So value them, find them, recognize people who, you know, figure out a way to recognize who they are. You know, I I, I typically run people through that questionnaire that I have because it, it helps me understand them better. Uh, if I'm thinking about working with somebody and I want to understand them better. So I, I, I don't push them, I don't force them to do it, but I say, hey, if you fill this out, you might find that interesting and most people will do it. And, uh, but it's not that so subtle and probably not that perfect, but it's a reasonably good indicator. Most people say their self perception is fairly closely matches what they get on the result. So it's just understand yourself and understand other people and value them for what they are. We cannot, our society is way too complicated not to have specialists. I don't, I'm not bad mouthing specialists. We cannot achieve what we achieve today and keep this whole thing running without people who focus. I don't happen to be one of them. <laughs> so I'm happy not to be one of them. And, and I know who I am and I'm happy to be who I am. Uh, I have no focus at all. I might in a typical day read articles on 25 different topics, completely different. But each time I'm doing it, I'm trying to integrate it with what I already know. So I understand the world a bit, little better the next time I look. I hope that's useful. Yeah, that's fantastic. So unless anybody has any final question, um, um, we're going to let Bruce go. I'll, I have a question. Yes. Um, Bruce, do you, do you know of any program or any workshop or any training that T-shaped people can do or can go through? So that they would uh, work on that skill of communicating and and um, working on that skill of um, working with other people, other shapes. I don't know of anything that specifically focuses on that. It sounds like your program might be an excellent program for somebody like that. It's not, I mean, MIT Systems Design and, and Management program seems to be an excellent one for people with that mindset. Uh, but I don't know of anybody who kind of focuses on, you know, on T-shaped stuff. I've toyed with the idea of teaching people how to be good bridge people and good, good, you know, good synthesists if they are synthesis or help them evolve from being T-shaped people to synthesis, which can happen. But, uh, but I never went anywhere beyond dreaming about it, never figured out a way to make it actually pay, make it work. But, uh, but it was a fun idea to think about. There's a very useful question. I just don't know of anything other than you know, just exercise it as a muscle. Do it yourself as much as you can. <clears throat> Read stuff outside of your comfort zone and then try to integrate it with what you already know. And it, it, the more you do that, the stronger you are at that aspect of it. The, the getting along with people aspect of it and, you know, asking questions the right way. I can give you one bit of advice that I've just have found invariably useful, which is if you're talking to somebody outside of your specialty area, 
make a concerted effort to understand how they use jargon and terminology and use theirs and abandon yours. Never try to use your terminology with them. Use theirs. Mm -hmm. And people are a lot more comfortable if they're not having to sort of interpret between what you're saying and what they think you're saying. And so, you know, you find out that somebody calls a particular thing a, uh, oh, let's say you, they call it a, uh, uh, I'm just going to say a widget, then call it a widget. Don't call it whatever you called it before. Just recognize in your own head that you, what they, what you called something else is what they call a widget. And then use the word widget when you talk to them. At one point, I was trying to help a company that was having trouble with uh, uh, two senior pre vice presidents that the CEO had had ordered never to be in the same room or talk on the phone directly because they every time they did, they got into furious screaming fights and caused everybody to get worked up. And uh, I think he was afraid they'd have a fist bite if they were in the same room. Uh, it was pretty ugly. And the CEO asked me, it's one of my clients, uh, asked me to, to, to pick their brains because they had a problem they needed to solve that needed both of their expertise. And so what I did is I went back and forth between them, talking to them about the topic we were trying to figure out but every time I shifted between them, they were in two different specialties and their place where they overlapped, they refused to use the other's terminology and they were colliding. And that was partly why they were so furiously at arguing. But I would, every time I shifted, I'd talk to one in language A and talk to the other one in language B, but then I'm integrating it and then I'm able to come back to the CEO with, okay, here's the integrated content that will work. And uh, uh, that was purely because I went to them and understood how they use the language and use theirs. And if, and I asked them to correct me if I was using it wrong. And rapidly I could start to use it in a way that they were completely comfortable with. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Um, I have one more question. Last, last question. Sorry. Sure. Um, so would you say consultants are mostly P-shaped? Not really. It depends on what type of a consultant they are. There are specialist consultants that, uh, you know, that are pretty close to eye shape. They may have a little bit more flexibility in talking with people because if you're a consultant and you insist that everybody use your terminology you know, when they collide, you're not going to get along with them very well. Okay. Thank you. And so, yeah. I hope that's useful. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Uh, fantastic, Bruce. Thanks again for uh, being the sole survivor of the COVID uh, lecture series <laughs> section of the semester. By the way, if, if you can stand it, I'll tell you one more war story. Let's, let's hear it. I'd love to hear it. Okay. So I, this, back, back in the day, I worked for Honeywell, which back then was a software and hardware company. Uh, that was in the 70s and early 80s. And uh, uh, one of my friends was a more, far more senior than I at the time. He was probably in his late 40s or something when I was in my 20s. And uh, he had been invited to go to Russia under the auspices of the State Department and teach Russian programmers who are assembly language programmers how to use COBOL, which is a uh, third generation language that's fairly English-like. You know, if you want to move a value from point A to point B, you say move A to B. That's how you, that's how COBOL looks. And uh, so he's teaching this class through an interpreter who is not a technology person, probably is a KGB agent because most interpreters in Russia were at KGB agents. And he was teaching this class to, these, to this agent and he's starting to talk about various aspects and the concepts and such. And he starts to talk about, you know, he doesn't know Russian, so he's just going in English and this guy's interpreting. And he's got a fairly hot, an audience that's paying close attention, pay, you know, really focused and the, audience seems to be following what he's saying. And he starts to talk about how you define various types of fields, like how do you define a numeric field and a text field and a date field and things like that. And as he starts to talk about that, the audience starts to look like they're getting glaze-eyed, like they're, it's not working. And this is a very experienced teacher, so he's realized that something's wrong. He tries a couple of different angles. Now that doesn't work either. So he calls a halt, takes his interpreter, takes one of the eager beaver students is sitting up front looking sharp and he goes and finds another interpreter and he starts to interrogate the student through the second interpreter saying, are you guys lo losing me? And they, oh yeah, we're lost. We have no idea what you're talking about. And he says, well, what's confusing you? And the, through the interpreter, the, the uh, student says, well, I can't understand why you keep talking about pastures. He says, pastures? 
you, you're talking about like pasture length and pasture type. The interpreter was interpreting field into pasture, and the students were having a little bit of trouble interpreting, figuring out what in blazes he was talking about. So eventually he said, well, yeah, it says to the student, okay, this concept in assembly, what do you call it in Russian? And he said, the guy says what the word is. He says to the first interpreter, when I say the word field, use that. And then he tried it out with the student a couple of times. He says, okay, we're, and he went in and was able to successfully teach the class. But uh, that was using somebody else's language, an, a, an extreme case. <laughs> Excellent. That reminds me of the early um, attempts at uh, artificial intelligence systems to translate the copious amounts of um, Russian communications that were picked up during the Cold War and the old, uh, the thing which you know, everybody's probably heard, uh, you know, the, trend, the failed efforts at this were kind of all uh, illustrated by this one example that went south where they tried to translate um, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that came out to um, uh, the vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. Ah, I love it. Um, so um, yeah, thanks again, Bruce. Um, I'm actually going to be uh, very likely at the University of Utah um, for the full fall semester. So I don't know if you have anything scheduled over there, but you know, I'll talk to Rob Webker and um, nothing yet. Okay. Well, if you want to come out, maybe. Um, We'll get you out there um, if you happen to have marvelous, interest. and uh, you know we can talk some more. Marvelous! Thank you very much for inviting me, and I wish everybody a very pleasant rest of your day. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.